So what I'm going to talk about is just the process over the past year. Sorry, I'll slow down. At identifying um, my research interests and looking at the needs of the field and where we are now and where we wanted to go. Um, so the first work that I'm going to talk about is the two survey research um, projects we did, which was about understanding the workforce of yoga therapists and the evidence-based practice attitude and utilization survey. Working into the second paper on understanding yoga's roots in evidence-informed practice, which then moved towards into it moved into our explanatory framework of yoga therapy, and then our, in, into our most recent paper, which was just published in February, which was about the convergence of yoga therapy and polyvagal theory. <clears throat> so, just to start at the beginning, is um, I in wanting to get involved in research, I talked to James and Stephanie about what was needed, where to go, what my interests were. So they helped me to identify this idea that yoga therapy as a new field hasn't ever been studied as far as who are yoga therapists, how are they working, and what does the field need. So um, Stephanie talked a lot about this idea of research as a puzzle piece where what we're looking at is trying to figure out what's needed and how my own research interests fit into that. So we collaborated with Matthew Leach who created the eBase Evidence-Based Practice Utilization and Attitude Survey. And um, he's, he's, he created that specifically for complementary and integrative health professionals. So we worked with adapting the workforce survey and the eBay survey um, and modifying it for our population. So we worked from that into, building, into looking at the relationships we had. So we worked with the International Association of Yoga Therapists for the distribution of the survey. And we also pil piloted both the workforce survey and the eBay survey um, with different colleagues to just find out like, how the questions landed, if they resonated with people, what was confusing, what we were missing. We went through the MUIH IRB and we had exempt status. Um, we started this work in um, 2015. So the survey was delivered in October 2015. Um, we sent out an in invitation email. Two weeks later, a reminder, and then it was open for five weeks. So we analyzed the survey, and just to kind of get a sense of the timeline of the whole thing, is in October 2015, we um, delivered the survey, and it took us about a year before we had the final analysis and publication ready to be submitted. So the workforce paper we submitted in September 2016, and it was published in January 2017. And then the evidence-based practice survey in February 2017 and March, and it was published in March. So just a, a few of the findings. So for the workforce study, what we found across the workforce study is that there's a lot of diversity in the field of yoga therapy, just like there's a lot of diversity in yoga therapy research. So it kind of paralleled that. Um, phys uh, sorry, physical therapists. Yoga therapists were typically um, 40 to 69 years old, female and college educa educated. Um, and people's yoga therapy training was diverse. So the standards in yoga therapy education are pretty recent. Um, I think we did the standards in 2009, if I remember correctly. And the uh, first accredited schools have only been in the last like three or four years. So most people that identify as yoga therapists, because we ask people to self-identify, um, were what they called seasoned yoga therapists, meaning they hadn't gone through an accredited program, but they gathered their expertise over years of working as yoga therapists or being interested in yoga therapy. Um, David said um, income was low, so that was important to see. For practice characteristics, it had that same diversity. So a lot of the issues in yoga therapy research is that the, the styles of yoga aren't adequately, adequately defined, and there's not a lot of clear reasoning between using one style of yoga compared to another style of yoga or why different practices are chosen. So um, yoga therapists that responded to our survey um, had 20 different styles of yoga that informed their practice, so it's very diverse. Um, and many yoga therapists practice other modalities. So what this graph shows is that many people practicing yoga therapy are integrating it into their other health practices. So um, nutrition, Ayurveda, psychotherapy, physical therapy, recreational therapy, nursing, and occupational therapy. So a lot of people who are practicing or, or doing yoga therapy are integrating it into their other healthcare practices. Um, 
yoga therapists teach both in classes and one on one. And just like everything else about it, there's this diverse um, conditions that people go to yoga therapy for. And so one thing I thought was really interesting is yoga therapists report seeing people mostly for musculoskeletal conditions and then mental health, um, chronic pain. Sorry, I'm only pointing to that side, but um, that, I can't see over there. Um, and, and then cardiovascular disease, you see kind of down the line. Not many people are seeing clients for yoga therapy for cardiovascular conditions, which is actually like the exact opposite of the research. The research in yoga therapy is actually stronger for cardiovascular conditions. It's growing in musculoskeletal and mental health, but really in musculoskeletal, it's only growing in low back pain. So people are going to yoga therapy for musculoskeletal health, but there's a gap in that idea of where the research is and what people think yoga therapy is for. So there's this um, discrepancy between what the public understands yoga therapy to be, what yoga therapists are actually seeing, and what we have research for. So you know, we need to let people know that we can be used for cardiovascular conditions. Um, and we need, need to do more research and other things besides low back pain. Um, so several obstacles we found that need to be addressed for greater acceptance of yoga among health consumers and healthcare providers. So one was increasing access um, of yoga therapy to underserved populations. Most yoga therapy is being done in urban populations. The, the direction we really went with our research was identifying common core principles and practices in the various styles of yoga. So we looked at creating a shared explanatory framework in our research. Um, and then building a stronger evidence base. So helping the evidence base be stronger to meet the needs of what the public wants. Because what the public is interested in attending yoga therapy for is musculoskeletal conditions and mental health. So increasing the research base in those. When we looked at the evidence-informed practice survey, what was great is that many yoga therapists viewed evidence-based um, practice positively. They were moderately prepared to engage in it but they were participating it at a relatively low rate. Um, what you'll, if you might not be able to read this, but what you'll see is the most used source of evidence-based practice was actually traditional knowledge, meaning like yogic texts um, or t yoga teachers, as well as personal intuitions. And it's only like further down the line that people were using um, journals and publications in order to inform their work. So even though they're interested in it and they view it fairly positively, they're, they don't necess they're not necessarily using the best sources. Yeah. Yeah, and it's probably influenced by lack of literature and also lack of access. Yeah. So what we found that we needed to help people do was to facilitate more imp uh, improved access to yoga therapy literature, um, help to create greater investment in yoga therapy research, and the creation of evidence-based um, practice training and education. So um, what I learned in writing these two papers was first how to write a research paper. So I was, <laughs> I was responsible for writing the introduction and the discussion and the conclusion, um, which those are the parts I enjoy most. Um, and then it was also really interesting to think about how to I identify journals for submission. So this was survey research, and there's a limited amount of journals that accept survey research for publication. So we had to find the publications that would take survey research. Um, and we chose complementary therapies in medicine because it accepted it, but also because it had a relatively good impact factor. I was telling someone at the... Um, research symposium, I found this like cool website called, I think it's called like Journal Guide, and you can put in your title and your abstract, and it'll give you a list of all the journals that might be interested in it. And then you have to go through it, and you have to see which ones will accept it. Do you know it? Okay. It's called something like that. I can, if I'm wrong, I have it bookmarked. But. Um, I also learned how to submit an article. So Stephanie walked me through writing a letter to the editor, how to language that, um, and sending it in. And then the peer review process, which I find fascinating. Um, and I think it's, some, it's like an incredibly positive experience in that you get to really clarify what you're trying to say. You get to see how people respond to it. And it can also be um, not as positive. <laughs> so it can have both sides to it. Um, and so I, think, I just think it's interesting that we don't have more opportunities for people to learn how to peer review. Um, so, and then again, just the timeline of a study. In a, in a moment, I'll show you an example of a peer review that was actually incredibly positive and really helpful. Um, so did you submit your paper in February and then it's published in March? 
Yeah, so the second one. So we submitted. Is that like a magic potion or something? No, it was really, well, because they were the same, same journal. So okay. like the first one was a workforce one. And so that one took a little longer. It was September 26th to January 17th. So by that time, we'd had the peer review from that journal. We knew all the issues they had with the first paper. So all we had to do was make sure that we had taken that into account. And I, we got it like accepted. It was so fast. It was like a day later or something. And then it was finally published. And I think it's just because like they had gone through it before with us. Yeah. That was really nice. Um, so then uh, Diane, Stephanie, and I wrote this paper for Yoga Therapy Today, which is the yoga therapy magazine that Laurie um, edits. And what we wanted to, the, the intention behind this paper was we wanted yoga therapists to understand that incorporating evidence-informed practice was not at all antagonistic to their tradition of yoga. That in fact, like yoga is based on a form of traditional evidence-informed practice. So we took the three tenets of Sankhya, which is the philosophical foundation of yoga, and the, the three tenets are about the development of discriminative wisdom. So in order to uh, attain wisdom in yoga, you have to understand the ideas of perception, inference, and valid testimony. So we took the description of what those three things mean, and we tied it to the three tenets of evidence-informed practice to show how they parallel each other and how they, how they parallel each other. Um, and then we worked on this paper, which was the main paper I worked on. Um, and I was just looking at time, okay. Um, so this paper we worked on is called Towards an Explanatory Framework for Yoga Therapy Informed by Philosophical and Ethical Perspectives. So moving from the workforce, part of my intention and really want for the field is to create a shared language among traditions and lineages to help, um, to help create the shared language so that when we go to healthcare providers, when we do research, we're all coming from this shared perspective. We can do it in different ways, but that we all at least are talking in a very similar way so that researchers know who we are, healthcare providers know when to refer to us, and the public knows when to, when to come see us. So in uh, talking to James, I learned that what I was interested in was called an explanatory framework, because I didn't know what that was at the time. Um, and the other thing I learned uh, from James was the idea of eudaimonia, which was this incredible terminology that I'll explain in a moment if you don't know it, that helped me to develop a language of translation. So I've been a physical therapist and yoga therapist in Georgia for over 15 years, so I've always had to, had to frame yoga in a way that was interesting to people of southern roots. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what eudaimonia, what eudaimonia gave to me was also the way to explain this to medical professionals. So I've been able to use this language, and I presented it at um, this paper at Grand Rounds at Children's Hospital of Atlanta. I presented it at the medical school um, at University of Maryland, they have a journal club as part of their complementary and integrative health elective. Um, and, um, and it's gotten really positive like reception. Like people are really excited about understanding what it is that yoga therapy does in a way that's not like too flaky for them or whatever, you know, it's not too boo. Um, so I've, I learned that. So then John Sullivan's my husband. And he um, helped me to understand how to pronounce eudaimonia. He's a, <laughs> he, and I, I still work on it. He's a history professor and a religious studies professor. Um, and so the Greek way of saying it is eudaimonia, um, just so you know. Um, and then I worked with uh, I, Matthew Taylor, someone that was the past president of IUIT. And he's been someone that um, has always been someone, I, he was always been like a support, a mentor, a colleague in, physical, he's a physical therapist in integrating yoga into physical therapy. And he introduced to me to two of the co-writers, Christine Weber and Laura Schmaltz. And then of course, Stephanie, always, whenever I go to her, she helps me take my ideas and make them into like actionable, practical plans of being able to do something with them. So um, I, I brought Christine Weber on board because she had written a paper on using the yamas and niyamas as a lens for yoga therapy in, I think it was in Yoga Therapy Today. So I brought her on. Uh, Laura Schmaltz is the editor for the International Journal of Yoga Therapists, which is a peer-reviewed journal. And both her and Jessica, who had been a friend of mine from before, um, for a long time, they had both written theoretical mechanism papers for yoga-based practices. So I brought, uh, so Christine, Laura, Jessica, Stephanie, and I wrote this paper. 
And so what I needed to learn was what phenomenology was, what eudaimonia was, and what virtue ethics were. So I'm just gonna briefly, I worked in making this a uh, really brief uh, definition of these concepts. So um, phenomenology is an attempt to understand pure phenomena of the body, mind, and environment from an unbiased perspective outside of judgment, expectation, and belief. So it's really this beautiful dynamic language about how do we understand our pure experience outside of all the stuff that we put on our experience and all the story we put on our experience. It also has this concept, which is really pertinent to yoga, of the lived body and the lived experience, where they talk about how the body and the world are constantly co-constituting and co-creating one another. Um, and if you think about the painful or ill body, this becomes really interesting, that people in pain or people in illness begin to shift their identity with, of who they are, um, their thoughts, their emotion shift, their relationship with their peers, like uh, we heard the talk about with social support, like all of that begins to shift. And so yoga, it offers a really great language for yoga therapy to consider, because yoga therapy is a methodology to tease apart um, our stories around what's arising in the body, mind, and environment. Yoga looks at, says that the causes of suffering are our misidentification with what's arising in our body, mind, and the world around us. And the alleviation of suffering comes from teasing that apart and understanding it and shifting our understanding of those. Um, and then the idea of eudaimonia, it comes from Aristotle, if you don't know it. Um, and Aristotle, it, it means a life well-lived or well-purposed. Um, and in Aristotle's time, you could only know that you had it after you died, because you would look back on your life and you would say, my life was really well lived. It was really, it was really well done. Um, but in research, they use it to talk about a state of flourishing, optimal happiness, a type of steadfast joy that is often connected to a sense of meaning or purpose. The virtue ethics are taught as guideposts to eudaimonia. So you would take concepts like forgiveness or friendliness or kindness or humility, and you would decide in every moment, where am I on this virtue? Where am I on this ethical principle? So at this moment, forgiveness is a concept I might be working on. On one end of forgiveness is a lot of guilt and blaming myself for everything. On the other side of forgiveness is not taking any responsibility for my actions. So in every moment, I can take any of these ethical principles and decide what is being called for in this moment. And if I live according to that and in alignment with that, I'll live a well-purposed, well-met life. Um, and then first person, person ethics is the exploration of how a person holds these beliefs and lives these beliefs. Um, so yoga has this concept of dharma. And the definition of the word dharma means the actions that support and sustain the person, but also the world around them. So when someone is living in alignment with that, their dharma, that means that they're living in alignment with their higher self, their purpose, their meaning, but in a way that supports the world around them and the people around them. When you live in alignment with dharma, yoga says that, you, it, that, yoga says that it brings about a steadfast joy and equanimity, which is very much like what eudaimonia is. Um, in addition, yoga talks about yamas and niyamas as the ethical principles that lead you to dharma. So in the Mahabharata, which is a text, um, like an, an epic from India, it's, it, uh, there's a place where the god dharma says that living in alignment with these virtues are the way that you enter dharma, the way that you understand dharma. So the yamas and niyamas can be used in yoga as intentional first-person ethical practices. So um, this is a graphic we developed. And... Um, this is where peer review was super helpful. So we had created, I don't know why they think researchers are graphic designers. It's like they should have people that make your graphics. Um, but what, what um, we originally had was the body, mind, environment, and the lived experience separate. Um, and our peer reviewer said that it would make more sense if we combined them. And, sh and they were completely right. It's made a huge difference in the, in the talking about the study. So what, our, what the thesis is, what the hypothesis is, is that in the experience of illness, pain, or disability, we create a experience of our mind, body, and environment, a relationship with our body, mind, environment that creates a lived experience that perpetuates suffering. Likewise, suffering can change my lived experience. Suffering can change my relationship with my body, mind, and world around me 
that perpetuates or makes worse my illness, pain, or disability. When yoga is utilized through this philosophy, through first-person ethical inquiry, and through the idea of teasing apart the layers of body, mind, and environment, discriminative knowledge, we can create an intentional reorientation of identity towards meaning, purpose, helping someone find alignment with their dharma. And then the asana and pranayama and meditation can be given in alignment with experiencing eudaimonic well-being and experiencing that shift in identity. So then what happens is this shift over to this side where we create a change in the lived experience in relationship to the body, mind, and world that cultivates eudaimonic well-being. And then the experience of eudaimonic well-being likewise shifts back down and creates a different lived experience or relationship with our body, mind, and world that shifts our experience of illness, pain, or disability. So the significance of this is that instead of looking at yoga as I'm going to do asana for this musculoskeletal imbalance, I'm going to do pranayam to help relax the nervous system, I'm going to do this meditation to work with some kind of attentional control, we can say, no, the intention of yoga is to create this shift in identity, this shift in lived experience, this connection to eudaimonic well-being, and how do I create an integration, uh, integration of all the practices of yoga towards that? So it allows us to apply yoga therapy within its own um, perspective and paradigm versus adopting an external one. It also supports the understanding of yoga therapy as a distinct profession for the public healthcare providers and organizations. Like I get asked all the time about how physical therapy and yoga therapy are different, and this is how they're different. Physical therapy restores function. It increases range of motion. It's a super profession. But yoga therapy changes the lived experience of someone in illness, pain, or disability, which is really important um, in especially chronic conditions and chronic pain. Um, it also creates a shared language for the lineages and traditions of yoga um, to assist in the development of clinical reasoning skills, um, assessment, and intervention. So that we can look at, um, someone was asking me about yoga therapy intervention earlier. So when we look at this as a model for yoga therapy, our method of intervention might have some musculoskeletal component, but it's also going to be about the lived experience. It's going to be about their quality of life, their connection to life, their meaning, their purpose, eudaimonic well-being, and there's some skills for that. So this paper, we started talking about it in June 2016. We submitted it in March 2017, and it took a while to get the peer review, you know, feedback and all that. But we published it in December 2017. Um, originally, we were going to publish it in the International Journal of Yoga Therapists, um, and we had to find a journal that would take hypothesis papers, because not all journals do. Um, and we chose alternative therapies in health and medicine because it has a bigger audience, and we really wanted this to go into like the complementary integrative healthcare audience. So we chose that journal. So our next steps are to develop this consensus on the explanatory model for yoga therapy, to understand potential neurophysiological frameworks that correlate to the application of these philosophical principles, to support the development of the professional practice of yoga therapy. And this is where we went next with the polyvagal paper. Um, and then the utilization of phenomenological methodologies for yoga therapy research. So um, for... To think about this neurophysiological framework, we wrote this paper, Yoga Therapy and Polyvagal Theory, Convergence of Traditional Wisdom and Contemporary Neuroscience for Self-Regulation and Resilience. Um, so I, reached, so I uh, actually met a student in the online course I teach, Physical Activity and Health, who knew Dr. Stephen Porges, who wrote the book on polyvagal theory. And um, so she introduced me to him through email. Um, I reached out to him um, in November 2016. We talked in January 2017. And it was just super amazing to find out that here was this amazing neuroscience that was not only okay with, but really interested in how a wisdom tradition could overlap and take on his neuroscientific framework. So that was really cool. So we, um, I continued to work with Laura, Stephanie, and Stephanie, and Jessica, although I didn't put her name on the slide. Um, and I uh, brought Matt Urban, who is a physical therapist who has worked with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in DC and um, has worked with integrating polyvagal theory in his clinical practice for years. Um, we um, both 
Dr. Porges and Laura um, talked about submitting to frontiers of human neuroscience. Um, and so when I looked at the, and then Dr. Porges actually said, look to see if they have a research topic, because they do these big research topics. And so they, were, they had a research topic, and it was called Somatic and Body-Mind Approaches to Resilience. So a research topic is where they like combine a bunch of, like the, the editor finds a bunch of articles from um, a bunch of authors and puts them all together. Um, so it was cool. They had one in exactly what I wanted to write. Um, the problem was is that this was in January and the deadline was March and there was no way like we were going to be able to do that in three months. So they were already putting it on uh, like extending the deadline. So they were extending it to the end of this year. So we, we wrote it from uh, January, February 2017 to November 2017 and then it was just published in February. So I worked really hard to get this um, description down to two minutes. I think it'll... I think it'll work. Um, so what this is the graphic we made for this paper. So what it says is that the periphery of the eye is what is called purusha, which is the observer of the experience of the body, mind, and world. So yoga teaches that the observer of the body, mind, and world is distinct from what they call prakriti, which is the psychophysiological and worldly constituents of nature. So everything of the body, mind, and world is prakriti. Yoga teaches that what is cultivated first is this very top circle, so right there. And what, we, what you cultivate first is what they call sattva. And sattva is a quality of nature uh, from which emerges things like connection, peace, and calm. That is, has some parallel in what Stephen Porges calls the ventral vagal complex, which is an aspect of the parasympathetic nervous system that when it's activated, from it emerges connection, peace, and calm. So very similar um, emotional and behavioral attributes. Yoga then teaches that once we create this ability to regulate, to self-regulate, we then want to work with resilience because the world isn't really about always being in a peaceful, calm place. So yoga also teaches what's called this capacity for resilience. And what that means is that when I can be with all of the fluctuations of the body, mind, and world, all the things that arise in bodily sensation, my thoughts, my emotions, and what happens with the world around me, and I can stay connected to that observing presence of Purusha, what arises is a steadfast joy or equanimity or um, similar to the idea of eudaimonia. Um, so that's the graph. So yoga therapy is proposed to facilitate eudaim eudaimonic well-being with its many effects for physical, mental, and behavioral health for diverse populations through the building of self-regulatory skills and cultivating resilience in the system. So again, getting out of this idea of yoga therapy for this condition or this diagnosis, but that if we look at the underlying effect of yoga for diverse conditions, it helps to facilitate self-regulation and resilience. Um, the attributes of the gunas of yoga and the neural platforms of polyvagal theory aren't the same, but they are reflected in one another. So if we, in, if we work with the underlying guna state or underlying neural platforms that underlie physical, psychological, and behavioral attributes, then it provides a methodology for applying yoga for regulation and resilience. So um, just implications is that yoga therapy research needs to include the comprehensive, comprehensive system of yoga and intervention protocols where we're always integrating, like for it to be yoga, we need to be integrating yama and niyama, asana, pranayama, and meditation. Um, the application and research of yoga for diverse populations would benefit from being directed towards such ideas, such as facilitating eudaimonic well-being. In addition, the targeting of yoga therapy interventions to underlying guna state or neural platforms to enhance self-regulation and resilience and its relationship to the cultivation of eudaimonic well-being is proposed. So our future directions is to begin to explore some of these relationships. So to explore the relationship between things like the experience of eudaimonic well-being with interoception and different measures of the neural platforms, such as heart rate variability, um, as underlying mechanisms through which yoga therapy has its effects. We also um, could look at testing the hypothesis of the convergence of neural platforms and gunas and then defining the gunas in a way that has consensus across traditions and their relationship to neural platforms. So we're looking at next steps and really being able to test these models of yoga therapy as a mechanism, especially for me, my interest is mostly in chronic pain or has been in chronic pain. And that's it. So um, just thank you for 
listening. And um, thank you for all the support of everyone that has been in my classes and asked really wonderful questions and all the teachers and mentors, colleagues that are here. Thanks.